Hey, BioFairies, and welcome to our continuing discussion on population genetics. Today, I'm going to be discussing the causes of gene pool change. Uh, we've already discussed now uh, what a gene pool is. We've discussed how we can calculate both, uh, well, genotype frequencies, uh, phenotype frequencies, and allelic frequencies in a gene pool using the Hardy-Weinberg equation and the Hardy-Weinberg principle. Uh, but as I mentioned, uh, there are five conditions that must be met uh, in order for Hardy-Weinberg to be an accurate equation. They have to have a large population, no mutations, no natural selection, no migration, and no, ra no, uh, no random mating are the five conditions that must be met for Hardy-Weinberg to occur. Well, as I mentioned, this rarely ever happens. Generally speaking, in nature, uh, populations do undergo changes in their gene pool configuration. And what causes these? Well, it's essentially the five things that would be opposite of what the uh, the criteria are for Hardy-Weinberg. Uh, the five things that I'll be discussing today that causes uh, uh, changes to gene pool uh, configuration are going to be genetic mutations, <laughs> is going to be gene flow, which is essentially migration. Uh, we're going to have non-random mating that's going to occur. We're going to have selective mating that occurs. We're going to have what's called genetic drift, and we're also going to have some natural selection. All of these can play a role in the change of the, uh, the frequencies of alleles in a gene pool. Let's take a quick look at all five of these. These are Some of these are going to be recaps because we've discussed some of these this year and even in Bio 20. First one, mutations. We discussed mutations earlier this year. Not a big deal. We understand that DNA is constantly undergoing mutations. When we copy DNA, when cells divide, there are always going to be a couple of little copying errors here and there that that crop up, and that's not unusual to have happen for any organism. Um, sometimes, or most times, these, these mutations are going to be neutral. In a few cases, they can be detrimental to the organism, and in some cases, they can be beneficial. And if they are beneficial, they can make a specific organism with that particular mutation in the population more um, fit to survive in that environment, and then they may be more likely to pass that genetic information down to the next generation, which then kind of skews the gene pool, right? Because that particular, there's a there's a, an advantage to having that that gene as opposed to, uh, you know, the genes that, the, the, the frequency that we had before is not going to be the frequency we're going to have after because now there's more likelihood of mating for those organisms. So we're increasing the odds of them being able to pass their genetic information down. That's going to have a play into the whole non-random mating thing, right? So if we have these mutations and they're beneficial, that can basically skew the other one, which is non-random mating. So that's something to keep in mind. Um, gene flow. Uh, organisms moving from one population to another. Great example of this are grizzly bears. Grizzly bears right now, uh, they originally had a historical range up and down the, uh, the, the western half of the United States and uh, uh, Canada, all the way up into Alaska. But their populations have become segmented now. Uh, they're isolated populations. For example, there's a population of grizzlies down in Yellowstone National Park in, in Wyoming, uh, Idaho, and Montana, which is the three states that sort of border that national park. Those grizzly bears really have no neighboring populations beside them. So they've sort of become an island onto themselves, and they can't get new alleles or new individuals to enter their population. They've become isolated and therefore... Uh, they have a limited gene pool, right? If I want, uh, you know, that gene pool to change, an or another grizzly bear would have to migrate into Yellowstone, which isn't very likely right now because the corridor, there is no corridor for these bears to reach uh, Yellowstone. Now, with that in mind, there's been an interesting, um, there's been an interesting take on this. That there's an actual, there's a group out there now called the uh, Yellowstone to um, the Yellowstone to Yukon uh, Conservation Initiative that's been started. And what they're trying to do is they're trying to create a corridor for bears to basically be able to move from areas all the way as far north as the Yukon, all the way down to where they're in their southernmost range right now, which is in Yellowstone. So there is a working with landowners. Uh, they're trying to buy uh, pockets of land that are, that, are, that are for sale. They're trying to keep these corridors open. They're trying to figure out where bears are actually migrating through to see... Uh, if they can create corridors where these bears can actually continue to move and transfer genetic information from one population to another to allow gene flow to, to occur. Because 
we understand the more alleles and the more organisms that are in a population, the healthier that population is going to be. Small isolated populations are going to lead to inbreeding, which is a real problem, right? There are certain organisms that just, if there's very small gene pools, it's very difficult. They're more susceptible because there's not as much gene genetic variation in those populations. Um, if you're interested in this, there is a video here that I'm going to link you to. Uh, it's a long documentary. It's actually a documentary by the PBS uh, show called Nova. Uh, the episode that I'm sending you to is one called Wild Ways. Um, the, the video talks about uh, different types of organisms all over the world and how they're trying to kind of protect them. Um, if you're going to watch the part of the video specifically related to grizzly bears, I mean, you can watch the whole thing if you want. It's a, it's a long video, though. It's about 45 minutes in length. But if you want to watch just a short section, uh, scan into the video about 8 minutes and 50 seconds into the video. That's where they just start discussing this uh, Yukon, Yellowstone to Yukon conservation initiative. And it goes on for probably about maybe only 10 or, 10 or so minutes. But if you're interested in looking at what that is all about and what they're trying to do to help these grizzly bears, give that video a watch. It's actually kind of a really cool thing that they're doing, how they're able to track where these bears are actually uh, moving and, and, and how they're able to do that using tracking devices on the bears and stuff like that. So interesting stuff. Um, National Geographic recently with this whole thing about gene flow and with humans, uh, we used to have, uh, you know, different um, variational groups of humans living in different parts of the world. That's obviously changing with uh, modern, <coughs> excuse me, first sneeze in an online video ever. There we go. Uh, and I might have more. Um, there, they, they had a video. Here we go again. <coughs> Whew. I'm allergic to population genetics, apparently. Um, so they, they, they did an article about what they think the average American is going to look like in 20, 2050. Um, this image here was sort of a composite they did of uh, just the different, uh, you know, racial groups that are in America and how there's been, uh, you know, there's just, there really isn't uh, marriage now necessarily based on racial lines and, you know, populations of humans that basically were sort of, uh, you know, varying, you know, populations around the world. Uh, that isn't really as much of a thing anymore because people are traveling and moving around the world and different cultural groups are, are coming into countries like the U.S. and countries all over the world, like, you know, in Europe and, and Canada as well. So they're saying that because of that, we're getting a much larger gene flow because we're getting all these different uh, variation populations that are basically coming together now. And we're getting sort of that, that genetic mixing pot, as it were. And they're saying that, you know, in theory, if this continues over a long enough period of time, uh, you know, the, the concept of race, which is kind of a really garbagey concept to begin with, we're all humans, but that concept of race is going to really get blurred because you've got people from all over the world that are now, uh, you know, meeting and, and, and having children and having families. So this is sort of an interesting thing that we're bringing in all these, uh, you know, these variations from different, uh, you know, cultural groups around the world. And uh, it's becoming really a mixing pot, a, a grand mixing pot of humanity, which is kind of cool. So that all relates to, again, gene flow with populations that are mixing together from other different parts of the world. Um, what else has to happen for gene pool change to occur? Well, I mentioned it already earlier with genetic mutations, but there is that whole aspect of non-random mating, uh, sexual selection, which we talked about back in Bio 20. Um, for example, caribou, uh, ungulates will fight for females. The strongest males will be able to mate with the females. Uh, you might remember I showed you a video uh, back in Bio 20. I might have shown that to you if you were in my Bio 20 class about uh, these grouse basically are on the, uh, the plains of, uh, of, of Wyoming and Western United States. And they have those big air sacs that they kind of go boop and they kind of make that really cool noise. And all the, all the female hens come out and check out the males. And literally only one or two of the males out of all the dozens that are out there displaying are going to get to mate with the females. And uh, they're able to look. And for some reason, they will pick a couple of males based on the traits that they are exhibiting. So this is very much going to drive your gene pool because only a couple of males are going to be able to bring their genetic information down to the next generation. And that will drive gene pool change or allelic frequency change because those males' alleles are going to be overrepresented in the next population. A lot of other males, their alleles are not going to get represented at all. And technically, those configurations of alleles will get lost because they're not breeding in the next generation. So uh, that's you know something to keep in mind as well. Um, 
probably the biggest concept of this section of the unit is going to be the concept of genetic drift. And this is where the government will will throw some, some monkey wrenches at you on a diploma, or I might show you some questions on a, on a quiz or an exam. But, you know, what is genetic drift? Well, genetic drift is basically uh, where you get um, uh, a large population that gets somehow uh, shrunk in size. So we talked about how with Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium principles, you have to have a very large pop population that would be uh, sort of immune to random chances in nature. Well, if you somehow take a population that's large and make it really, really small, um, now that population can be much more susceptible to, uh, to, uh, to radical changes in the gene pool. And I'll give you a couple of examples, and these are ones that you should be uh, fairly familiar with, because the government will actually bring these up, or you'll see this on a quiz or an exam. So uh, before I discuss them, here's an example of what I mean with genetic drift. So in the first generation here, we've got a bunch of uh, a, a, a bright pink and pale pink flowers. We've got mainly pale pink. We've got a couple of, of, of uh, a couple of pale pinks in there as well. Um, you know, they reproduce one generation, and the next generation we see that we still have majority of the the, uh, the, the the bright pink flowers and a couple of the pale pink flowers. But the second time they reproduce, for whatever reason, those pale pink flowers are unable to reproduce or pass their their configuration of genes down to the next to the next generation, or the heterozygotes in that population don't pass on their genes as well. And what you wind up with in that next generation is a whole pile of homozygous dominant flowers. Essentially, that recessive allele has been eliminated from the population. Not likely to happen in a very large population, but if it's a small population, due to random chance, you might have the, the if you have the right combination of organisms that don't breed in the population, you could actually lose an allele altogether. So in this case now, that final generation of flowers has a has a has a p value now of 1.0 and a q value of zero because basically there are no recessive alleles left in the population so that can only occur with a small population but there's a couple of specific examples that are that are kind of linked with genetic drift one of them is called the founders effect let's say i have a mainland population of organisms let's say we've got let's go back to bio 20. Um, mockingbirds from the mainland of South America. A couple of these mockingbirds somehow get swept out across the ocean. They fly out to the Pacific. They're now over the ocean. They are they're somehow maybe caught on some driftwood and they're out at sea and they fly out. And they wind up on a couple of little volcanic islands off the coast of Ecuador. You might remember them as the Galapagos Islands. We talked about them last year with Darwin. Well, when those birds arrived on the Galapagos Islands, they were the founders. They were the founders of a new population of mockingbirds that basically then became the, 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 the they basically spread themselves out across the islands. And it was one or only a few birds that basically came over and then their gene pool became the basis for all of the organisms that followed after them in that population. This very much occurs with island populations. Populations in the Galapagos Islands would be an example of this. Populations on the Hawaiian Islands would be an example of this. So this is where you get a small, new, isolated population of organisms that is, you know, very small in size compared to the mainland population because there's obviously mockingbirds back in South America still. But now these mockingbirds on the Galapagos Islands, for example, they have a specific set of genes that were brought over with those particular birds and now those traits are going to become overrepresented in the population that develops on the Galapagos. And that may make, may, might make that population initially already look very different from mainland populations of, go, uh, of the mockingbirds because of the specific variations that the, the founders of the population brought with them when they arrived initially on the islands as, that, as those quote-unquote biological pioneers of the islands. So that's what the founder's effect is. Another example is bottleneck effect. And the bottleneck effect is where we take a huge population of organisms and we basically decimate it or almost basically completely make it extinct. Uh, humans have done this several times, and not several, multiple times in our history. We talked about this in Bio 20. We talked about the bison almost being completely eradicated over uh, North America from you know hundreds of millions of animals down to just a few thousand. Um, we talked about the the black uh, the the um, black footed ferret. That's what I wanted to say. The black footed ferret, how they were down to only 18 animals until the last population was found in Wyoming, and they were brought into captivity. Because there's only a few members of the population that are left, 
only the alleles that are survived that are in the remaining population of animals or organisms are going to be represented when we try to bring that population back to a larger size. So for example, here in the original large population, you had maybe three variations of the allele. You have the yellow, the red, and the blue one. When we remove only, when we only have a few organisms left in the population, which would be over here after whatever the, the disastrous, maybe it was a volcanic eruption, but it could very well be something that humans have done, like we, you know, hunted them to extinction or brought an invasive species to wipe them out, you know, by accident, of course. But, you know, black rats will kill lots of organisms in their native environment. Um, you're left now with these alleles that are in the population. Those are the only alleles now that can be represented as that population goes forth and tries to reestablish itself in larger numbers. So that whole aspect of making a, a large a gene pool, a very small gene pool, hence the name of bottleneck effect uh, that's occurred. Uh, again, I've given you a couple of examples, the black-footed ferrets. We only had 13, 18 animals that we basically bred from almost the brink of extinction that now represent all the black-footed ferrets that are out in the wild now that are being reintroduced, as I mentioned to you in Bio 20. Another example of this would be the Lord Howe Island stick insect, the largest insect in the world, it was thought to be extinct in 1920. Uh, they discovered it uh, on another island off the coast of Lord Howe's Island, which is off the coast of Australia. Uh, they found a population of only 24 of them in 2001. They basically brought them back. Uh, they brought them into a captive. They, they brought them into a captive breeding program. They brought them into a zoo. Here they are, massive insects, completely safe. They're just they're herbivores. They're, they're not any danger to humans at all. They had um, uh, by 2016. Uh, the Melbourne Zoo alone had already hatched 13,000 eggs, and then they set up breeding programs all around the world. They're now looking to basically bring these uh, these uh, these uh, insects back to Lord Howe Island, but they have to get rid of the rats that basically caused them to become extinct on the island to begin with. That's why they were driven to extinction on the island. And uh, the thing is, though, even though there's you know 15 or 16,000 uh, Lord Howe Island stick insects that were bred in Melbourne, remember. They all originated from only 24 animals. So that bottleneck effect of there's only so many genes in that very small population, and all those genes are now represented in the larger population. The only way we can get more variation, again, with the, generic, the, the, the gene makeup in that large population would be like genetic mutations, right? That would give us more variation eventually, but the bottleneck effect was because there was only 24 animals to basically reestablish the population with to begin with. Um, yeah, and then again, uh, yeah, and that, that'll be it for now. And then the last one, uh, natural selection, obviously, is the only process that leads to directly to evolutionary adaptations. We know what a natural selection does, right? It sort of plays in with non-random mating and mutations um, and, you know, finding variations that are beneficial to the organism uh, in their environment. Uh, this can, again, drive uh, gene flow change if there's a certain allele that becomes more beneficial to a population that allele will become overrepresented in that population and it will go forth being a larger percentage compared to what it was before uh, maybe that change in the environment occurred. And uh, one last thing, uh, with natural selection, sometimes you can have what's called a, heter a heterozygote advantage. Uh, sometimes having one copy of the allele is an advantage, uh, even though if you have two copies of the allele, it can be very detrimental to you. I'm going to bring up this disease one last time in bio because I haven't mentioned it enough times already. Sickle cell anemia. This is a great example of the heterozygote advantage. If you have one copy of the sickle cell gene when that mutation occurred in West Africa, it gave you sort of a resistance or a help with malaria. If you wound up being a heterozygote and you married another heterozygote or had children with another heterozygote, you had a one quarter opportunity or one quarter chance of producing a homozygous recessive child that had two copies of the sickle cell gene, which would then cause them to have sickle cell anemia. But because the heterozygote configuration of the alleles is beneficial, that sort of destructive allele is left to stay in the population because in one configuration it's helpful, in another configuration when it's in a homozygous configuration, it's not helpful. So that's sort of why sometimes dangerous alleles can remain in populations because of that heterozygote advantage and that is sort of driven by natural selection because initially it was a genetic mutation that was favorable to helping that West African population stave off malaria which helped with 
the non-random mating where people that were healthy were the ones that were heterozygotes because they weren't getting malaria. If they were homozygous dominant, they weren't uh, sick because they were homozygous recessive. Only the heterozygotes or most of the heterozygotes were the healthy ones that were producing families. So that allowed that gene to continue in the gene pool, even though in a certain configuration, it is very deadly and dangerous to people who have it in a homozygous configuration. Another example of this would be cystic fibrosis. That's another one. Um, if you have two copies of the allele, you get that mucus buildup in the lungs, the pancreas, the liver, and the intestine. But if you have one copy of the allele, it actually helps you resist diseases, uh, uh, diarrheal diseases like cholera. So there are there's a higher frequency of that allele in populations that are prone to cholera, like in India, uh, in Bangladesh. Uh, so there, there, there is an advantage to having one copy, but again, two copies of the allele winds up giving you, uh, you know, that, that terrible condition known as cystic fibrosis. So another example of a heterozygote advantage. Okay, uh, there we go. That's it. There's a little recap slide. Take a look at it. I'm not going to discuss it. I've talked enough today. Uh, to finish off today, Watch the video. Hank's going to recap population genetics. He's going to wrap up the last three videos that I've discussed, uh, talking about your different frequencies in a gene pool, Hardy-Weinberg principle, and what I discussed today about the causes of gene pool change. All three of the videos wrapped up right here in this great little video put together by Crash Course. That's it for today. Uh, homework for tonight is there's two things. Uh, you're going to work on the Hardy-Weinberg principles, a principle, sorry, question booklet. I don't know why it says principles. Let's just do Hardy-Weinberg Principle. The Hardy-Weinberg Principle question booklet, that'll be the first one you're going to need to work on. And I'm going to actually ask you to do questions out of the textbook. <sighs> Heaven forbid. Uh, here are the questions for the textbook. I want you to do questions 1 to 5 on page 697. That's going to cover the, the, con the content that we talked about today about the causes of gene pool change. That's it for today, ladies and gentlemen. Thanks for tuning in, and we will see you real shortly. Take care.